Welcome to Healing from the Ground Up. I'm your host, Leslie Gray, and my guest today is Dr. Stanley Krippner. What a pleasure to have you on, Stan. It's a pleasure to be here with you. Dr. Stanley Krippner is an author with over 600 publications. He is a professor of psychology. He holds the chair of consciousness studies at Saybrook University and many, many, many other things. Uh, and, to, and his most recent book, uh, he co-wrote with the grandson of Rolling Thunder, City and Morningstar. And uh, the book is called The Voice of Rolling Thunder, A Medicine Man's Wisdom for Walking the Red Road. Could you tell us a little bit about how this book got generated and what your hopes for it are? Well, yes, we were delighted that the book finally came out. It took us seven years to find a publisher. And I don't think that publishers felt that Native American ways, Native American medicine was of interest to the general public. But we'll see. The book just came out, and we hope that people will buy it. They'll learn a lot about Native American healing. They'll learn a lot about Rolling Thunder, who is an incredible medicine man, and they'll also learn about how healing themselves from the ground up is possible through nutrition, through different types of uh, purifications, thinking good thoughts, and of course Rolling Thunder used the sweat lodge, and I'd been in many sweat lodges with him where you sweat out all of the impurities. And also, they'll learn many, many stories about healing in the book. One of the things about the book that strikes me is because it is a, a process of Rolling Thunder's grandson going around to various people that knew his grandfather and asking for personal stories, it's almost like you get to see the, the inside of a healer, uh, um, not just the great work that they do, but the com complexities of their personality warts and all. And um, I think that's very helpful to people who it will help them stop waiting to be perfect before they try to be healing. Yes, very important. Rolling Thunder always said, well, I'm far from perfect. I have many, many vices, and he certainly did. <laughs> but what you say about interviewing people is important because the very cover of the book has to do with healing. A photographer by the name of Kerry Geiner wanted to photograph Rolling Thunder for a series that he was doing on Native American elders. Well, by the time that he got to Rolling Thunder, he had a incurable disease. Doctors had given him less than a year to live. So he showed up at Rolling Thunder's camp and not only did Rolling Thunder heal him in two or three months, but he said, you've got to wait for the right time to take the photograph because Rolling Thunder was very, very particular in terms of photography. He didn't like his photograph taken. One day, a young man at the camp brought in an eagle that had fallen out of the nest and the eagle was screaming and squawking and Rolling Thunder just took the eagle and touched the eagle's head, and the eagle was at peace. And he said to Carrie, now you can take your photograph, and that's the photograph that ended up on the cover of the book. That eagle looks as peaceful as a dove. It's amazing. And yes, and shor shortly after the photograph was taken, the little eagle just flew away back to the nest. Extraordinary. Many, many extraordinary stories about uh, Rolling Thunder exist. Yes. Um, one I heard that, uh, I know that he didn't like to be uh, recorded either. And I believe there's a story about uh, a major news channel trying to sneak and record him. And what happened? The tape turned out blank. Yeah, Rolling Thunder felt that he could operate best face to face with people, mm -hmm. not through photographs, not through videos, not through recordings. So he did that, but very, very sparingly. 
For example, he allowed Mickey Hart, the drummer from the Grateful Dead, mm -hmm. to tape record several of his speeches. And Mickey Hart made those tapes available to City of the Morning Star and myself. So this is why the book is called The Voice of Rolling Thunder. We quote extensively from the tapes that Mickey Hart lent to us so that we could get Rolling Thunder's exact words, his point of view about politics, healing, global warming, the environment, predictions for the future. And so we've got a lot of his talks and excerpts of his talk interspersed throughout the book. Yeah, there's this dual aspect of him, of uh, sort of teacher and visionary and direct hands-on healer. Yes. And it seems like he was willing to allow the teacher aspect to be recorded, but mistrusted the healing, that felt that the healing needed to be done one-on-one. -on -one. And what that makes me think of is, you know, when I think of Rolling Thunder, who who I, I knew as, and you were a very good friend of his, I, I was a, a friend, but, um, you know, I, the thing that strikes me the most is his presence, that this is a, and this is hard to talk about because it's an element of healing and that it, it's, you can't teach it, really. I think it's a mixture of something in the person and, uh, uh, a, a skill they develop about interaction between people and a plane of rapport or something. But, um, w you know, what did you, I was wondering, okay, we both know that Rolling Thunder had this, this extraordinary presence. Mm -hmm. and, but you've known shamans from all over the world, traditional healers from all over the world. Would you say that you saw this in, in other traditional healers or? Well, yes, I think that presence is a very good word for what you're talking about. With Rolling Thunder, people were captivated by his eyes because he had very, very piercing eyes. Mm -hmm. And many people said that he could see right through them. So they didn't dare tell a lie. They didn't dare try to pull something over on him mm -hmm. because he could see the truth with his piercing eyes. Mm -hmm. and. I have also been with shamans in Brazil, and they stand out from other members of their tribe because they also have a presence. Sometimes it's in their movement, sometimes it in, is in their songs, sometimes in their eyes, sometimes in their paraphernalia, their very colorful vestments. And this serves a dramatic effect that, of course, is one of the ingredients in healing. Because if you're going to come to somebody for some sort of healing or alleviation of distress or illness, and the healer shows up in shabby clothes, unkempt, unshaven, um, looking like a bum, <laughs> you're not going to be immediately impressed by the healer. You might be eventually, once you can see through the exterior. Mm -hmm. But as part of the healing paraphernalia and as part of the healing ritual, presence is a very, very important aspect of it. Mm -hmm. Of course, medical doctors in the United States also know this. This is why they dress up in white coats with the stethoscope, even though they're not going to listen to a person's heart, and the white coat they don't really need, but that's the presence. And that puts the person into the right frame of mind to get something of benefit from the encounter. Um, it just crossed my mind to ask you, would you have called Rolling Thunder's voice hypnagogic in any way? Or Rolling, did he... Yeah, Rolling but, Thunder when he spoke, didn't have what I would call an eloquent delivery. I think that what was impressing you about the voice was the authority of the voice. Mm -hmm. And yeah. he would often finish a lecture 
or a phrase by saying, ho, mm -hmm. that's it. That's the way it is. Mm -hmm. And then that was the end. And then you knew that you had gotten the message. <laughs> and there are many excellent speakers. Well, Abraham Lincoln was one of them. The new movie about Abraham Lincoln captures his voice very well. He did not have a very commanding voice, but the words in the presence are what made his speeches unforgettable. Mm -hmm. So, you know, as I see what's happening to modern medicine, it seems to be less and less personal, less and less quantity of time with the with a particular doctor, healer, social worker, psychologist, uh, and uh, and of course telemedicine removes you from the actual yes. presence of the person entirely. Um, what do you think this is going to do to human healing? If you were going to guess about the future. Well, it certainly is making it more automatic and even robotized. I think that people still get well. They might not get well as quickly. Mm -hmm. But you see, Rolling Thunder often said, I want to wait three days before I will work with you. That's what you told Kerry, the photographer on that picture, even though Kerry had a life-threatening disease. He stayed in the camp for three days, and then Rolling Thunder started the cleansing, the sweat lodges, the herbal medicines, etc. But, you know, you bring up a very important point, because I do a lot of work with post-traumatic stress disorder, mm -hmm. and another one of my recent books is PTSD. That's also available on Amazon.com. And... There has been a recent survey of veterans who have PTSD coming back from the horrible wars that the United States is engaged in. And, of course, the first recourse is to give them medicines, to give them drugs, to try to alleviate their pain and distress. But this recent survey indicated that they actually prefer therapy to medicine. And also there's a lot of research right now showing that Therapy is even a little better than drugs in terms of alleviating PTSD. Also, psychotherapy doesn't have the side effects that medicine has. And group therapy is especially effective for PTSD, where you not only have the psychotherapist, but you have other veterans who are in the same group. So I don't think there's any substitute for human contact. It's not the only way to help and heal people, mm -hmm. but it certainly is an essential ingredient for many, many people. Mm -hmm. And Rolling Thunder was very good at this. He didn't have the 10-minute appointment that most physicians have with a client in a uh, hospital setting. He would spend hours with them doing a ritual, mm -hmm. and that human contact and following the directions of what he was doing and listening to him, he listening to them, is something that mainstream Western medicine just isn't set up to do in a doctor's office. Yes, a psychotherapist will do this, and of course you pay $100, $150 an hour for it, in the Bay Area at least, but uh, um, it's probably worth it if a person cannot get relief any other way. So of the various uh, shamans that you have studied and uh, spent time with and visited all over the world, um, are there any that, um, are? I'm wondering, what are some of, if what would be the universalities? What would be commonalities that you've seen among them? Or well, of course, there are commonalities. There's also great differences, yes, I know. as you well know. But I would say there are maybe three commonalities. First of all, shamans work within some sort of a community. They've been trained by other shamans. It's not something that they get from books. 
they have had a tradition that's been passed down to them in some way or another. So there is a community context that's very important. Second, shamans claim to be in contact with what we can call the spirit world. In other words, they operate in dimensions of existence that ordinary people can't enter, except accidentally, sometimes in dreams, sometimes with drugs, sometimes with illness. They might slip over into the spirit world and they might see departed loved ones or deities or angels of one sort or another. But shamans can get there on their own. They have that mastery to enter other dimensions of reality. And then I guess the third commonality that they all have in, in common is that they use some sort of ritual. And the ritual can be very simple, such as a prayer, or it can be very elaborate, like the sand paintings that I've seen among the Navajos, where they have a very elaborate sand painting that the medicine man or medicine woman has constructed that the sick person sits in the middle of while all of the chanting and ritual goes on and then the painting is destroyed at the end of it because its power is used up. Mm -hmm. Now that ritual has been very effective for hundreds of years among mainly among uh, Native Americans of Southwest United States also some other parts, and it's something that Western medicine just wouldn't have the time to do. So rich, but they have their own rituals. They have their own rituals. You know, Rolling Thunder had never met any Western physicians before I introduced him to Dr. Irving Oyle, who you also knew, who's no longer with us, but who was a great physician an osteopathic physician. And I got the two of them together and they went into a private room on Mickey Hart's ranch, by the way. And they were there for a couple of hours and we didn't know what was going on. And they came out arm in arm and Dr. Oil said, you know, Rolling Thunder and I figure we do pretty much the same thing. <laughs> and we all do a ritual. The first part of the ritual is getting to know the person who we're trying to help out. Mm -hmm. And then the second part of the ritual is for me to write out a prescription, is for him to give herbs and maybe some prayers and offerings. And then the third part of the ritual is to make sure that the sick person actually carries it out and that completes the circle. Mm -hmm. So whether they want to use the word or not, Western physicians have a ritual. A ritual is a step-by-step -step process of getting something done. Mm -hmm. And that's what healing is all about. You told me once about um, a, a ritual that you ended up in accidentally in the Amazon of, with tea. Are oh, yes. I've been to South America many times. I've been to many of the Native American tribes in South America and have many wonderful stories. But you're probably referring to the Guarani shaman, Joao. And I was with a group of people who had been given permission to sit in on one of his rituals. We didn't know that we were going to become part of the ritual ourselves. So we were sitting in a circle about as big as this room in our television studio, sitting in a circle on the ground. Again, this is healing from the ground up because shamans like earth. They like to be grounded. And then the shaman began to do some chanting and some of his assistants, three very, very beautiful statuesque Indian ladies came out and did a beautiful dance. I thought, oh, this is a wonderful ritual. <laughs> but then I was unprepared. He took out this big pipe and he put some smoking mixture into it. And he took a puff and he passed it to me. 
Well, what was I to do? I didn't know what was in it, but I've had enough substances in the Amazon and in South America before to know that they've all been helpful. <laughs> so I took a puff and passed it on to the next person. A few of them were from the United States, a few were from Canada, many were from Brazil. And it came back to him, and you know, I was feeling pretty good after that. But it wasn't over. It wasn't over because then he took a gourd, and the gourd had a beverage in it. And so he took a quaff of the beverage, he passed it to me, and so then I took some of the beverage and I passed it on, and everybody took some of the beverage. Well, I was feeling even better by this, by this stage of the game. So then he took an even larger gourd with another beverage <laughs> in, a third beverage, and took a big gulp of it and passed it on. I did the same, passed it around. And after these three beverages and, and snuffs and <laughs> smoking mixtures, uh, oh, am I going to see visions? Am I going to be transported out of my body? No, nothing like that. My mind was perfectly clear. And that clarity is something I wish I could bottle. It lasted for a couple of days. My mind was so clear that he said, I'd like each of you to give a prayer. And my Portuguese isn't that good, but that night it all came back to me very, very well. And in my best Portuguese, I said, my prayer is for the Guarani young people who are hanging themselves in protest against the big business that is taking over their lands and stealing their property. And the shaman said, how did you know about that? And I said, I keep in touch with what goes on in Native American circles in your culture. He says, you're right, let's all pray for those young people. And I said, look, they don't have to kill themselves anymore because now we know about it. The young people have to take action and have to be militant and fight these people who are disobeying the Brazilian law. I was saying all of this in Portuguese. My Portuguese hasn't been so good since. <laughs> And now I'm not going to say that this is due to me, but we have not had that raft of killings among the Guarani, people committing suicide, since that ceremony. Mm -hmm. So that was a very, very momentous occasion. It's a combination of many things, including the, the power of a circle, the power of community, and the power of prayer. You had all of that together. You had the circle, the completion, you had the uh, substances being passed in the circle. You had the uh, ritual. You had the communal, pr pr everybody else gave a prayer too in um, English or in Portuguese. And so we had a lot of prayers going on for different things. Yeah. There is actually something like that that sort of started in Canada recently called Idle No More. And um, there is a, a woman who is a chief in Canada. Her name is Spence, Chief Spence. And she started fasting because the Canadian government was doing destructive things to Indian lands, etc. But it's caught on like wildfire, and it's woman-led. Um, and many of the, those tribes, as is mine, Iroquois, are matriarchal and had women leaders and women warriors. And um, um, I've been struck by the gatherings that these people have been having containing many of these same components that you're talking about, prayer and circles and ritual and repeated behavior and identification with a trusted, powerful figure. She's a very trusted, powerful person who's obviously willing to sacrifice a great deal for her pe people. And that has just spread. It's rippling. And it started in Canada, and now it's all over the world. Well, I'm glad to hear that. And they've involved the internet in it because they have these flash mob prayer groups. <laughs> I think that's one thing Rolling Thunder might not have minded about technology. No, I don't think he would have. He, uh, of course, 
had passed over by the time that the internet was going and yeah. that the cell phones were in vogue. But uh, he actually appeared in two movies called Billy Jack and the Trial of Billy Jack. He had cameo roles. He saw this as a way to spread his message because the Billy Jack character had certain things in common with Rolling Thunder. You can get the Billy Jack movies on Amazon.com, by the way. Mm -hmm. And the director and the star of the movie, Tom Laughlin, tried very, very hard to portray Native Americans in uh, their true light. And he had Rolling Thunder and other Native Americans as consultants to make sure that all of the ceremonies were accurate. Mm -hmm. So when I was in Canada for the last time, I actually went to a potlatch. And a potlatch, for the viewers that don't know about this, is a giveaway. A noted person in the tribe dies and his, and his relatives uh, accumulate a number of material possessions and then they have a big ceremony and they give these away as a way of commemorating the loved one. Well, this is basically done in the western part of Canada, what we call the Pacific Northwest Tribes. And it goes on for several days. And they actually had about 100 chiefs from other tribes there, and all of them got beautiful blankets and other gifts. I was happy just to get free food <laughs> for the days. But much to my surprise, I ended up being given a beautiful hand-painted drum which shows the creatures of the sea. It's in my office. It's a prized possession. Didn't there's a picture expect. of it in the book, I believe. Yes, there's a picture of it in the book. Mm -hmm. Yes. And it's a remarkable piece of art. So the interesting thing about all of this is that the Canadian government, much better now than it was 100 years ago, outlawed the potlatch outlawed the spirit dance, outlawed a number of rituals. They wanted to Canadianize the Native Americans. Mm -hmm. And same thing happened in the United States. Mm -hmm. Now, here's a surprise for your viewers. The president that stopped this, that said, no, Native Americans can live on the reservations if they want, this was Richard Nixon. Mm -hmm. Rolling Thunder had a crusade against babies being taken from Native American homes and put into white homes. Richard Nixon stopped that. Rolling Thunder had a crusade against industrial firms encroaching on land and tearing down trees, the pinyon nut trees, which were a source of, of protein, and they were violating the law. Richard Nixon stopped that. So Nixon did maybe a few good things when he was in office. And the reason he was partial to Native Americans is that his football coach was a Native American. Hmm. And he kept saying, I learned so much about fair play from my Native American football coach. And I said, yes, you didn't learn enough. <laughs> well, this is part of the paradox of America. The paradox, you bet. And uh, Rolling Thunder understood that very paradox very well. And this book, uh, gives you both his understanding of it and his humor about it. Yes. So thank you so much, Stanley, for being willing to speak about the book. I mean, there's so much more that I'm sure we can say at another time. Um, I'm your host, Leslie Gray. You've been listening to and watching Healing from the Ground Up. See you again. <laughs> <laughs>